Welcome to a revision session for British Empire um, AQA A level um, module 1J. And today we're going to look at Joseph Chamberlain's um, attempts to strengthen the British Empire. Did they end in failure? Accessibility of this view with reference to the years 1895 to 1914. Now, Joseph Chamberlain is one of the most dynamic, uh, significant individuals on this course. He was described by Winston Churchill, no less, as the man who made the weather. He was an ardent social reformer and also a passionate jingoistic imperialist. He was a man of contradictions and charisma. And we will endeavour to look at his successes and failures in his attempts to strengthen the British Empire. He's often described as the most influential man never to become Prime Minister of Great Britain, and I would definitely concur with that view. His legacy still lives on to this day, and yet many people are unaware of his name. He truly revolutionised the city of Birmingham, and he split not one, but two political parties on his strong opinions, both the Liberal and Conservative parties of the late Victorian era. So without further ado, let's have a look and I'll give you some insights into his character. So he's born into a non-conformist family of uh, shoemakers, a shoe, shoe manufacturer family. And he was a non-conformist, which meant that his family were non-conformists, which meant they did not attend the Church of England. Now, is this a, pers is this a possible explanation for his alternative way of thinking, never conforming to uh, what mainstream society wanted, and therefore he wanted to dictate what mainstream society's values were? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe that's a little bit of a stretch. Anyway, he entered uh, the family screw-making business and essentially has three careers. One as a uh, uh, businessman, one as the mayor of Birmingham, and another as the colonial secretary. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So he entered the family um, screw making business and he showed extreme business acumen and flair. He displayed uh, organizational abilities and at the age of 38, uh, he was able to retire with a substantial fortune. So there's the screws there. Okay, he was very famous for that in Birmingham. He then entered um, swiftly after his retirement, well, just before his retirement, he entered the arena of politics and he revolutionized Birmingham. So he essentially put in social reforms or was the, char the charismatic leader behind these social reforms, especially of gas and water works. Um, not just that, education, he built great libraries, public baths. Um, he cleared the slums and developed much better housing. And he made Birmingham the first modern city in the world. Now, if you compare London in the 1870s to Birmingham. Birmingham was a technological marvel. And other cities and other leaders in the world essentially mimicked what um, Joseph Chamberlain did. Now, that's a great legacy. This is really Chamberlain at his best, if you want to look at him as a man who did good in regards to social reform, as a man of local, more local politics. So these early successes really are things that he should be proud of if you know he was still alive anyway here's a little red flag for you so he um swiftly entered parliament after revolutionizing birmingham and um he <laughs> he was extremely radical when he first entered parliament and he scared the conservatives with his bravado charisma um and his sheer ability to speak now i bet they were absolutely delighted when he walked the floor over towards them now he wasn't a socialist but he was on the radical wing of the liberal party and he certainly had sympathies with socialist uh, policies and he certainly instituted them in um, birmingham but he was never a member of the labor party he was a member of the liberal party now at the time in the late 1800s the labor movement was kind of in its infancy and it wouldn't be until keir hardy uh led the uh the early labor party in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s that Labour would start to form the political juggernaut that it really is in um, in Britain today. So at the time, there was a two-party system like we have today, really, and it was the Liberals and the Conservatives that were the two parties which would alternate in power after elections. So away from that and back to Joseph Chamberlain and kind of 
where we get to in our question, because let's not forget a question. Let's just have a look at the question again and remind you what the question is. Joseph Chamberlain's attempts to strengthen the British Empire ended in failure. So this is all kind of contextual information thus far. So here we go. Now, in one way, he did strengthen the British Empire in one way, because in 1886, when the uh, Home Rule uh, issue came to the Commons, Chamberlain joined with other dissident liberals against the grand old man, old Gladstone, when he tried to institute his Home Rule Bill. So by Joseph Chamberlain opposing him and becoming essentially one of the leaders of the um, Liberal Unionists, he did preserve the British Empire by denying the Irish Home Rule. Or you could argue that by denying the Irish Home Rule, this accelerated Ireland leaving um, the British Empire and being partitioned. But certainly he wanted to preserve um, home rule over Ireland. And to that degree, he was successful from 1886 to 1921. OK, um, so a short term success or a medium term success. Um, now, when he became a liberal unionist, they entered an electoral pact with the Conservatives because the Conservatives also didn't want to see home rule in Ireland. So he essentially split the Liberal Party into two and would really never recover in the long term from this. It was it was, had a terrible impact on the, on the Liberal Party. And he was willing to serve in the government of the uh, Conservative cabinet under Lord Salisbury. OK, so in 1895, he was offered the chancellorship, but he turns it down because he wanted to be Secretary of State to the colonies. So what you're seeing from 1876 to 1895 is a shift in his politics. He goes from being this radical social reformer to this ardent imperialist. Clearly, one was more important than the other. Now, that's not to say that um, Joseph Chamberlain ever lost his sympathies for the plight of the working class man. It's not true. It's just that the imperial ideals um, underpinning the British Empire became the most important thing for him. But he does try to fuse these two things later, and we'll, we'll get on to that. Okay. So... Uh, in office, <laughs> he's always embroiled in controversy. So almost certainly, almost certainly, he tried to organise something known as the Jameson Raid, which was an illegal invasion by Leander Star Jameson of the Transvaal by what the by what Paul Kruger and the Boers would call Uitlanders, okay, by British settlers, foreigners to the, the Dutch settlers, the Boers. And um, he was cleared in the Commons um, by Salisbury, in essence. Salisbury's pressure allowed him to be cleared in an invest investigation. But he did um, offer to um, to resign to Mr. Salisbury. But Lord Salisbury um, said, look, I don't want you to resign. He, he realised that um, Joseph Chamberlain's charisma was too valuable to lose, so he kept him in his cabinet. Okay. But his anti-Boer stance and his willingness to go to with the Boers was quite clearly uh, demonstrated there. Now, um, moving away from Boer conflict for a second, because we're following this chronologically now, that Jameson raid happened in December to uh, from 1895 to January in uh, 1896. Chamberlain um, <laughs> worked very closely in the 1897 uh, Diamond Jubilee. And he, as colonial secretary, he ensured that it was a festival of the British Empire. And he uh, he basically <laughs> uh, did a little deal with Queen Victoria and said that only uh, the foreign guests that should be represented should be from the British Empire. We shouldn't allow any other foreign guests to the um, the British, uh, your, your, your jubilee. Uh, and so what he did, he was able to fuse the ideas of monarchy in the British Empire and intertwine them into a, a single thing. So the monarchy really did represent the British Empire symbolically. And there was great pomp and ceremony and grandeur on the streets of London. And Queen Victoria was a very popular queen, just like Queen Elizabeth is a popular queen today. A queen who has a long reign is always popular in England. You've got Elizabeth I, Queen Victoria, Elizabeth II, all very popular queens for their public service and their tradition. So moving on. Um, <laughs> so... Joseph Chamberlain, um, this is known as jo the, the Boer War, the Second Boer War, is really known as um, Joe's War. Now, the Boers had defeated the, the British, much to their humiliation, um, in the 1880 to 1881 uh, First Boer War. And Joseph Chamberlain, being an ardent imperialist, was not happy with this. 
Now, he uses his Boer War to electoral success, so we just need to connect these two things. So there's something which is known as the 1900 um, Kharki election. Now, it's also known as something as the Overton window. So the Overton window is the ability of the British public or any public to be able to focus on a certain amount of issues. And in the election, usually one or two issues will dominate. And so if you can make the election, uh, the election based on a war, then you can fight that very successfully. Um, especially when you can use prejudice and patriotism. So as you can see on the bottom right of the screen there, uh, Joseph Chamberlain uh, made posters saying that the Liberal parties were essentially traitors and they were supporting um, Paul Kruger. And he you know, claimed that a vote for the Liberal is a vote for the Boer, the en i.e. the enemies of um, the British. Now, in early, in 1900, when this... Um, election was fought the british were doing quite well and they thought the war would be over quite soon that was obviously a premature view okay nonetheless joseph chamberlain was able to use um this conflict to win this election for um the conservatives and the liberal unionists once again so we could say that this is a success of um and certainly the diamond jubilee was a success and initially, the Boer War was a success of radical Joseph Chamberlain's attempts to strengthen the British Empire. OK, but it's all about to come crashing down. I think this is really Joseph Chamberlain at the zenith of his imperial success as the secretary for the colonies. Now, we can see that you've got the words Tariff Reform League here. So this is when Joseph Chamberlain abandons his position as colonial secretary. He resigns in order to put all his intellectual energies into the Tariff Reform League. Now, it's a little bit complex, but so basically you'd be aware that the European Union is a trading block um, and they don't have tariffs and there's free trade within the European Union. Although it's obviously a little bit more convoluted than that. But in this way, you could say Joseph Chamberlain was a visionary because he wanted a trading block, but the trading block that he wanted to establish was quite simply within the British Empire. Uh, this was very controversial at the time because Adam Smith had written his Wealth of Nations that global free trade was the best kind of trade. So free trade had been dominating. But when you have free trade, it sometimes other countries can, they're so competitive, it can undercut your nation's industries. And obviously, we would understand from previous lessons, you had the long depression and Britain's um, industrial output was being outstripped by Germany's and the USA's at this point. And Joseph Chamberlain really wanted to preserve the power of the British Empire. So on the left, you've got his tariff reform league. And on the right, you've got a little bit of Liberal Party um, propaganda there. OK, so. Sorry, you've got his his conservative um, propaganda again there on the right. OK, so showing that tariff reform would lead to happiness and free trade would benefit everyone. Now, the Liberals were able to say that there would be a big loaf, little loaf election. OK, so. Asquith, who was the leader of the Liberal Party, essentially said, if you vote for the Conservatives in the 1905 election, you will get a little loaf of bread. Now, at this time, bread was a very substantial part of a working class person's diet and still probably it's a major part of everyone's diet today. Um, we are very dependent on grains for our carbohydrate content. Anyway, away from that for a second. So this this Tariff Reform League is an amazing failure for Joseph Chamberlain. Now, really, you could say long term, he's a visionary because really the world does exist in these kind of trading blocks and free trade doesn't exist in the way that it did at this point in the Victorian era and that tariffs are actually quite useful for preserving uh, the economic success of a tra of a trading block. Just look at the European Union. How, however, it was very controversial, and maybe he was too ahead of his time. So, Joseph Chamberlain used all his charisma to try and bombard the working class man with the benefits of tariff reform, and maybe he did have a point. But the fact was that at the time, most of Britain's bread imports came from abroad, and therefore. If you put tariffs on those bread, on those wheat imports from, from um, non-empire countries, i.e. the breadbasket of Europe, which is Ukraine, which was in Russia at the time, then 
most working class people at first would have been able would have only had been able to afford a small loaf of bread. Now, if you're a working class at the time and you can have a small loaf of bread or a big loaf of bread, well, you you're going to want the big loaf of bread. So Asquith, who was the leader of the Liberal Party, really was a genius in his electioneering here by calling it the big loaf, little loaf election. Now, unfortunately for um, Joseph Chamberlain, he um, he had a stroke. Uh, he had a stroke and this really put an end, really put an end to his ability to um, continue with his electioneering for tariff reform. And ergo, it really was known as Joe's last hurrah. So the underpinning motivations for his tariff reform league was that he wanted to unite the British Empire under the economic diktat of Britain, of Mother Britain. Okay, so this was a failure. And really, by 19, 1909, the David Lloyd George budget tariff reform was dead, dead in the water, and he dies. Joseph Chamberlain dies in 1914, and his final valiant attempt to unite the empire in a kind of Commonwealth trading bloc had failed. Now, later on, the Commonwealth becomes massively important for Britain as a trading bloc before they join the um, the European Union or the EEC as it was known then. So you could say that he was a visionary and his ideas just were too revolutionary for the time and he was always a radical reformer. And you can say that uh, he did have notable successes um, with his Diamond Jubilee culturally. Uh, in trying to strengthen the the empire with that it was definitely a massive cultural success the um the khaki election was a huge success in um joseph chamberlain using um the patriotism and imperialism to unite the country according to his views certainly but his grand scheme of uniting the british empire as a trading block to the exclusion of everything else that was a failure. That was a failure, at least what in his time and in the within the parameters of this question. Okay. All right. Well, that's enough for me talking today. I hope you use this for your revision and I hope this test goes very well. Goodbye.